Good morning. I want to join you in this morning to reflect on the Gospel of Luke and what it teaches us. <clears throat> I was always taught the first thing to do when you start looking at a document is to find out who the author is and what sort of person the author is, and that will tell you quite a lot. So that's what I'm going to do with Luke. We get nearer to meeting Luke as a friend than we do to any of the other evangelists. From their writing, you can tell a good deal about the others. So Mark, for instance, is an inspired storyteller, the first evangelist. He recounts the stories about Jesus, which he had been retelling superbly vividly, with an eye for the touching detail, Jesus asleep in the boat with his head on a cushion last Sunday, or the demonised man of Jerusha, who was so strong that he just burst any bonds that were put up on him. They couldn't hold him down. And then he comes to sit, quietly reclothed, at the feet of Jesus. Mark's chief subject is the, the wonder of the personality of Jesus, so magnetic that the fishermen followed him, although they had no idea who he was. And it took a long time for Peter to discover and burst out with, you're the Messiah, at Caesarea Philippi. Matthew, by contrast, was a zealous Jew who thought and taught in the manner of the rabbis. You might almost think you're reading the Talmud when you're reading Matthew. He thinks like a lawyer, shows Jesus perfecting the old law with repeated key words such as righteousness and fulfilment, that come all the time. He loves absolute contrast of good and bad, sheep and goats, cunning snakes and simple doves, building houses on sand or rock. You can smell the Galilean countryside as Jesus walks around it. Now, what about Luke? <clears throat> Luke is much more cosmopolitan. In his second volume, the act of the Apostles, which he wrote too, suddenly as the story reaches the point where Paul crosses over from Asia into Europe, the person changes. It had been a narration about them. They did this, they did that. They went here and there. Now it becomes we. It suddenly becomes we sought to leave for Macedonia. Luke is an experienced traveller and he's travelling with Paul. He's careful to note how long it takes to get from one place to another, the hosts where they stayed, and how long they stayed in each city. He gets the names of all the magistrates right, town clerk in Ephesus, generals in Philippi, proconsul in Corinth. The whole story is fluid, moving, journeying. Mary, pregnant, goes on a week's journey into the hill country to help her elder, elder cousin. Then the great journey up to Jerusalem in the middle of the Gospel, where we have most of the teachings about the difficulties of being a disciple of Jesus. Jerusalem is the hinge, and the Gospel begins and ends in Jerusalem, and from there... The gospel spreads in ever-widening circles to Samaria, to Judea, to the ends of the earth by Paul's journey. <clears throat> it was meant for the whole world, all of whose citizens were gathered in that tongue-twisting list on the day of Pentecost. The story is complete when Paul reaches Rome, the capital of empire. Mark's world is the little world of the little corner shop, so that the apostles are forbidden to have even coppers in their pockets. Luke is at home in the wider world of international travel, travellers arriving in the middle of the night and wanting a loaf of bread, banks and rates of interest. So in Luke, the apostles are forbidden to have silver in their pockets. And in fact, in Matthew, they're forbidden to have gold in their pockets, that's a rabbinic exaggeration, who walks around with gold coins. For this reason, 
Luke situates both the birth and the baptism of Jesus in world history. With the census for Roman taxation, slightly exaggerated to the whole world, but a real event in Palestine towards the end of the nefarious Herod's reign. He gives a list of world rulers, local tetrarchs, Roman governor, and even the emperor himself, to situate Jesus' life in the real history of the world. Luke moves in a richer and much more cosmopolitan world, the world of the Hellenistic city. In general, Luke is much more open-minded, as befits an experienced traveller, so women are on a par with men as they were in the civilised Hellenistic world, but not yet in the Semitic Middle East. So he's careful to balance men with women. <clears throat> it's the gospel for both men and women. And at the Annunciation to John's Bap John the Baptist's father, as well as Jesus' mother, not only Simeon greeting Jesus in the temple, but Anna too. A man loses his hundredth sheep, and a woman loses her tenth, woman loses her tenth coin. Jesus raises to life not only the daughter of a father, but the son of a widow at Naim, so the crossing of the sexes there. Jesus forgives a sinful woman who weeps on his feet and a sinful tax collector who climbs a tree to get a better glimpse. When men and women follow Jesus to Calvary, it's to the women that Jesus speaks. The women who accompanied Jesus and looked after the group are mentioned several times. Luke's inclusivity is also well aware that salvation is for the whole world. So at the Great Supper, everyone's invited, not only the outcasts and dregs of the city, that is of Judaism, but all well, but there's still space and the messengers are told to go out into the countryside and compel the whole world to come in. So his gospel is for all the world, for everyone. Luke's an educated man with a sophisticated grammar and a wide vocabulary. He's also rather a chatterbox. When in Matthew, the, the invited guests refused to come to the banquet, were told just that. They refused to come. In Luke, they start blathering out their excuses about buying a new tractor or getting a new house or having a new wife. So they start speaking their excuses. The prodigal son rehearses his speech to himself before he goes back to his father. He gets it word for word. And when it comes to the point, he starts repeating it, but then he's cut off in the middle because dad can't wait to hug him. <clears throat> Nor, for that matter, is the angel Gabriel exactly lost for words. At the two Annunciation scenes, he quotes scripture at length. This love of crisp little speeches gives the writing a vivid and intense character. It also gives it a gentleness when Mary gently rebukes her 12-year-old son in the temple and doesn't bridle at his excuse. When Jesus so gently rebukes and encourages his Pharisee host while the woman weeps at his feet. So Luke makes good use of direct speech and this brings the gospel to life in a new way. Who is Luke speaking to? Who is his audience? What then does Luke have to teach in his gospel for the whole world? It's a gospel for the whole world, but Luke is careful to tell us that it comes first of all to the faithful of Israel. So in the first two chapters, the infancy narrative, the message comes first to the faithful remnant of Israel, not to Matthew's wise men from the East. All the characters of Luke's infancy stories are models of Old Testament piety. Even to the language we hear, it came to pass that, and so on. Old Testament language. So the story begins and ends in the temple and is the 
case of exact ritual observance, the piety of the offerings of the poor, the 40-day blessing after the birth, and is full of psalm-like prayers in the three canticles of the Magnificat, the Benedictus and the Nunc Dimittis. It is only after Israel has had its offer, and the offer has been accepted by the faithful of Israel in their poverty, that Jesus, in his programmatic speech in the synagogue in Nazareth, spreads to the whole world. He pronounces that his message and his salvation are like that of Elijah and Elisha, for the Gentiles, like the widow of Zarephath and the leper Naam and the Syrian. Another aspect which spreads out from the infant's stories into the gospel as a whole is what is now called the preferential option for the poor. Poverty is one of the signature motifs of the infant's stories. The parents of John the Baptist are the poorest of all, deprived of children by Elizabeth's barrenness. In Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph are outcasts whom no one will receive so the newborn Jesus has to be cradled in a cattle trough. He's welcomed not by grand wise men from the East with their sparkling presence, but by the poorest of the poor, the wretched hireling shepherds, although in heaven the angels are rejoicing. The parents can afford only the most meagre of gifts in the temple. There they are greeted only by the antique Simeon and Anna, hanging on to life in the faithful hope of the Messiah. So it's to the disadvantaged in Israel that the gospel first comes. And the disadvantaged have a place throughout the gospel. The same option for the poor continues. Whereas Matthew's Beatitudes focus on spiritual uh, qualities, the poor in spirit, the gentle, the needy, Luke's Beatitudes focus on real poverty. They're not a summary of spiritual qualities like Matthew's, but a stark statement of deprivation. You who are hungry now, you who are weeping now, with the corresponding checks on the opposite, alas for you who are rich, for you have plenty, you have plenty now. Luke is talking about people who are really hungry, where hunger is not a metaphor as for a strong desire for justice. For Luke, wealth is a real danger. The danger is stressed by the startling parable of the rich fool whose harvest is so great that he has to build new harvests. Fool, he doesn't know that God will call for his life the next day and also by the stark parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which stresses the need to treat the poor properly. It's a strong reminder that in the comfortable Hellenistic society in which Luke moves, there must have been poor people on the edge of starvation, the object of God's special care. One's a bit reminded of the Archbishop of Canterbury taking his turn as a seller of the big issue as was in the paper this week. I have yet to hear of a Catholic bishop taking the same stance. The poor were always an issue with the prophets. And it's in the initial manifesto, comparable to Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus is primarily a prophet. This will continue throughout the Gospel. His miraculous birth is already that of a prophet, like Samuel. When he brings back to life the son of the widow of Naim, they proclaim, a great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people. At the feeding of the 5,000, he again acts as Elisha in feeding his followers on meagre loaves of bread, though Jesus' miracle is a hundred times greater than than Elisha's, one loaf between a thousand, whereas Elisha provides only ten loaves between a hundred. The ascension also is the departure of a prophet, 
as Elijah goes up to heaven, leaving his cloak as an inheritance for his bereaved disciples, so Jesus ascends to heaven, leaving the Spirit for his disciples to come to them in Jerusalem. So one can expect the mission of a biblical prophet, which is not, of course, primarily to prophesy the future. The prophet is not um, uh, an enhanced weather forecaster, but his objective is to bring the people back, to show them that they're on the wrong track, to interpret them the folly of their action. Prediction of the future is no more than a function of this invitation to return to the way of the Lord. So Jesus is primarily a prophet, bringing the people back to their duty. So one principal theme in Luke is the need for conversion. And his people are, like ourselves, needing conversion, just like us. So this is linked to the, inf- the principal emphasis on conversion and repentance. The proclamation at Nazareth is centred on conversion and the stories of conversion are numberless in this gospel. Perhaps the most inviting of all is the prodigal son. The father is waiting anxiously for the son to come over the horizon and then waddles towards him faster than his dignity would allow and showers him with favours, including the signet ring, the signet ring, which would, of course, allow him to do exactly the same as he's done before with his father's signet ring. But the father loves him so much that he entrusts him with everything, whereas the son who's done what seems to be right turns out to be jealous and bad-tempered. So the prodigal son is like us. He's not even really repentant. He's just gnawingly hungry. And there's no sign of affection or lovely to see you again, Dad, or anything like that. Mm. Like all of us, he's between one thing and the other. There's the same tactful welcome for the woman at the feet of Jesus, who weeps there. No interrogation, no reproaches, no conditions. The same unconditional welcome for the good thief at that agonising last moment of his life. On other occasions, Jesus goes out to the sinner, doesn't wait for the sinner to come. He positively invites Zacchaeus of Jericho, who was only curious and had shown no signs of good intention, but was so thrilled with the positive invitation of Jesus that he immediately set out on his reform of his own bat. All we need to do is to acknowledge our need. Before you start to follow Jesus, you must acknowledge that you're a sinner. When Jesus calls Peter in the boat, Peter falls to his knees and replies, Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinner. The good thief admits that they're getting what they deserved. So, before you're called, you have to admit that you're a sinner. Another attractive feature of Luke's Gospel, which goes with this, is the mixed character of his personnel. In Matthew's parable, Matthew's parables, everyone's either a plain goody or a plain baddie, a harmless sheep or a vicious goat, a builder on sand or a builder on rock, either one thing or the other. In Luke, they're far more like ourselves, mixed characters, who find themselves doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. The friend at midnight eventually gets out of bed and gives his his neighbour a loaf, not out of pure unalloyed charity, but because he doesn't want the whole village to hear the knocking on the door. The unjust judge gives the right decision, not for the sake of justice, but because he's scared of being slapped in the face by the injured woman. The guest at dinner takes a lower place because he doesn't want to be made a fool of by being put in the lowest place of all. So he has good motives, but um, not absolutely pure. 
the crafter steward doesn't have an, an attack of integrity, but cleverly forces his master to obey the prohibition of lending it interest. The interest on the corn and the oil are the different interests that were charged for each of those commodities. And it was forbidden to lend money or anything else at interest. So the crafty steward, in getting the debtors to change their bills, are just getting them to change to what it should be. So he's doing a good turn. On other occasions, the baddie turns out to be the goodie. So in the Good Samaritan story, the priest and the Levite avoid the defilement of touching what they suspect is a dead man, while the hated Samaritan breaks every rule to do the right thing. This is much more like the real world. Our motives are seldom as pure as we would like them to be, but our paltry efforts are taken up by the Lord and refined and made use of and bring us to the Lord. One last point to take us through the day and make it a day of reflection. Luke is the evangelist of prayer. The Gospel starts with Zechariah offer, Zechariah offering his prayer with incense in the temple and ends with the disciples going back into Jerusalem to wait for the coming of the Spirit in prayer. There is that constant attraction towards Jerusalem and its centre, the temple, the place of meeting with the Lord. Again and again we find Jesus at prayer, at his baptism, before he called the disciples, at the transfiguration. When he teaches his disciples to pray, they merely join him in prayer, in his own prayer. Then there are the parables of prayer, teaching us how to pray with the perseverance of the widow, with the humility of the tax collector rather than the self-satisfaction of the Pharisee, with the simplicity of the Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, beginning not with Matthew's version, not as Matthew's version, our Father in heaven, but simply Father. Like Jesus in Gethsemane, I like that simplicity, Father. So let the genuineness and the simplicity and above all the warmth of the prayers that we have in Luke guide us throughout this day and make it a day of retreat and of approach to the Lord in humility and in poverty of spirit, knowing that what we give is not worth having and it needs to be transformed by the warm love of Christ. God bless you.